I'm going to read from a story called How I Miss You. This one is set Boston, 1987. Harvard Square. 25 kids board the car. All but four decline to sit. The decision happens without talk and is instantly irreversible. They will stand until Park Street, fixed to rails in subtly polarized teenagery compounds. They're on a field trip to the city, maybe wishing this less obvious. Mr. Mulford Herding. Their mission is photographs to take and to see. The ICA has a show of the guy who breaks wall-high faces into swatches. The bus part was old, but the T is a win. Bellwick High School promotes a Bellwickio-centric model of the universe, and the subway confounds this cosmology in a way that relieves the kids, unknots their necks where the camera straps bite, makes them want to become farmers or artists, or at the very least, diarists. The subway confounds with brown people, bandaged people, warty people, punks, and the frank, arousing stench of pee. This end of the red line is not much less white, but the bandaged, there a taped nose, there a wrapped knee. Not cast, but those splodgy foot splints you know cover fester. It's as though everyone on mass had something malign and secret removed. The festers might be subjects if the kids had the nerve to ask. You cannot shoot without asking. Of course, commuters in jewel tones read about love and vampires, but they're incidental. They've had nothing removed. They're not part of the experience and do not warrant photography. Sitting together are the Mulford pets, four strong, united in sexlessness. With Jean, it is Jean's. At 12, her body hit pause. Hers is a smallness, just shy of freakdom, still proportionate, laughable. It disarms the world. It makes the world smile to itself. Girls her age coo in her face. Classmates pick her up in the hall. They see her size as a personality trait and her as a toy. She sees it as a rate problem. Other people grow too fast. She does not want to make the world smile. On the contrary. With Smurf and Ugly, mothers are implicated. One meaty and schizo hoarding trash, talking all the time of poop to Smurf. The other frail and super Mormon, counting Ugly's calories. With Lusik, well, Lusik is foreign. Getting foreigner by the day out of spite if Belwick would only notice. In the two years since she moved here from the place no one cares about, Muslim, Hindu, Zionist, yes, she says dumbass, I'm Zionist, her accent has thickened. Your English is so good, where are you from? Thanks, and you, where are you from? Your English is mediocre. How she misses Mosi, if there is a word for it, it has slipped the crack between Armenian and English. Central Square. Peter Hudig, hair quite pubic, asks Lusik if her haircut is self-inflicted. Mosi's last do for her. You should shave it, Mosi said. Not yet, she said no. Give me a Betty Page, but short on one side. The pets run the journal. They published Peter's leprosy limit, but is he grateful? I love my hair, Lusik informs Peter without looking up. She's writing to Mosi in London, trying to stick to Armenian, but uses it now only to fight with their father or cook with their mother, and the letter comes out like a squalling baby. Baba's an ass about you. He can disown me too. What does he know? He never even met Michael. Not that I have, but I'm sure he's everything you say. I'll buy my ticket for June. I'll help you and Michael with rent, work in a lab, do summer school there. I'll get done with this dog shit for good in 10 weeks. Ugly and Smurf practice their madrigal duet, not embarrassed to sing. Smurf is wearing gloves for hygiene. Ugly is in her overalls. Still, with her high gloss hair and advanced ski slope nose, she looks like a silk screen empress. Her smile is a kind of safe sex, dispensed free to the viewer. Your voice gives me chills, says Peter to Smurf. How much for you to lick that handrail? I'll give you 20 bucks. Look who it is, says Smurf to Ugly, someone special. Jean deploys aggressive empathy stylings. Peter, how are you? I was just thinking of you, and I have three questions. What's your problem, Peter, says Julie Bosco. Why can't you leave us alone? She's hanging off the rail above the pets, way too close. Jean knows the pets agree. 
There's something low-grade yet annoying about Julie Bosco, and it's not just her allergy to pine nuts, which she invokes on all occasions, even when a person is just ordering pizza, pizza that in no way involves Julie, pizza that asks nothing of Julie. Sweat gives her hives, also latex. It is that Julie Bosco sees the world as a conspiracy of pine nuts and sweat and latex, when in fact the world was just doing its laundry, taking no notice of her. There is also the problem of her breasts. They are spry and individuated, large, and not entirely of one mind with Julie. Julie Bosco is dull, but the breasts are edgy and not without ambition. Go-getters. Kendall, MIT. College people swarm the rails. Ectomorphs, safe shoes, brains stewing in science. What troubles Jean is ionization. She pulls out her sketchbook and tries drawing what happens to sodium. She can't draw it, cannot grasp it, cannot grasp degrees and kinds of bonds when, in the world apparent, there is only one bond, absolute. If it were not for Lusik, Jean would never ace chemistry. If it were not for Jean, ugly would not ace physics. If it were not for ugly, Smurf would not pass biology. There is nothing Lusik would not ace if it were not for them. Lusik gets degenerate orbitals and noble gas cores, Dada, Stein, and the No Problem Orchestra. She can pronounce without effort all French vowels. Though the three will have choices, they will go wherever Smurf's GPA can take her. Jean can see this as if it has already happened. It is as necessary and right as the receiving ground when you fall. Ugly's parents and Lucix will have to face the music, the music of pet fidelity. Jean's will not hear any music. College, they'll say, well, good for you. Her sister Ruth spent senior year in the attic, no one the wiser till June. But lately, whenever Jean calls Lucic for chemistry help, Lucic's mother answers. Dozens of calls, yet she never seems to know Jean. Each time, Jean identifies herself, and Lucic's mother says, oh, in a disheartened way, and waits, keeps waiting, keeps waiting, like time and will might undo the fact of Jean. Finally, without warning, the mom calls up to Lucic in her own language, a stream of imposing length and force whose meaning Jean cannot know, but whose sound slurry she has memorized. When Lucic comes on, Jean always asks, what did she say? But Lucic just laughs that laugh. Jean gives up on sodium and draws these, these scientist hairlines. It is hairlines, more than noses or chins, that make a person look himself. For a while, Jean thought she would be the cop artist who draws how victims recall their attackers. Then she read that the victim's memory is half the time wrong. What they have together, the pets, is this great thing, a heavy thing. Carry it, and it feeds even as it depletes you. It is like a tick, but good, a tick that keeps you company and of which you cannot be free. Charles Street, MBH, MGH, sorry. The train pulls above ground onto the Longfellow Bridge. There are no signs urging you to call the Samaritans. They're busy people, and it's not that high. On with the scrubs, off with the warty. Below, the river presses on indifferent. Certain things are barred. No homeless people per sleeping shots. No high mom shots. No posed hilarity shots. No going AWOL in the combat zone. These are ways to fail. Between Park Street and the ICA, they will stop over in the garden. There, for an hour, they can be individuals on the loose expressing themselves, finding stuff to shoot. The pets plan to be individuals expressing themselves in a clump while eating fried dough. It's hard to fail art, I won't kid you, Mr. Mulford says. His voice is loud. The art room is his natural habitat. Outside it, some quality of Mulfordness is lost. He goes three-dimensional and strange. You see his skull more. Mr. Mulford frowns. C, all right, C minus for Julie and her passion for fashion sketches, which we hate. Julie Bosco smiles. You want to be called out. 
But to fail takes great cunning or great stupidity and a delicious hoodsy to any of you who succeed by either method, he says. It's important in life to shoot for the extremes. He never talks like this, thinks Jean. His head was never so cuboid. Park Street. The kids get off, atomize and reconstellate on the platform. The pets drift aft, others four. Julie Bosco orbits. Mr. Mulford leads them up rubber stairs. Unclimatized air encrypted with smells, exhaust, and sweet meats, cold. Everyone's breath steams. Brief suburban self-satisfaction is shared. They were in Boston on a weekday at 10. Mr. Mulford turns to Lusick, whispering, that was mostly for show that bit, a Blackboard Jungle remake. You think they liked it? I don't know, but your hair looked exceptional, says Lusick. Mr. Mulford checks his not quite baldness. The pigeon on the park sign shows him one black eye. Are you coming on to me, Mr. Mulford asks it. A vent tosses Jean's scarf skyward. Jean, look out, says Pete. When it's windy, do your parents keep you on a leash? Peter says ugly, you're an idiot. Honestly, he says, I'm depressed. You don't look depressed, ugly says. Last night, Peter says, I dreamed I was being e eaten alive by my hamster, Rob. He was doing it so slowly. It was more ticklish than painful, almost pleasurable, but still. Peter looks at Ugly meaningfully. Rob's been dead for five years. <laughs> Ugly sighs. You're not depressed. Cloud cover muffles the sun. The kids play with their apertures, trailing Mr. Mulford south along the common. Along Tremont, Mr. Mulford says, stay close. A barber shop with one lathered man staring himself down in the mirror. No barber in sight. Lusick, says Jean, him. She holds up her camera. Lusick shrugs. Her hair from behind is a wig falling off. At Temple Place, Mr. Mulford says, walk this way. Then he does the walk, arms limp, knees high, a Muppet fighting a wind. At school, the pets would copy a classic, but not here. At Boylston, they skirt the combat zone. Windows full of refurbished VCRs, the husks of strange squash. Down Washington, the neon is sparse but fulfilling. N-U-D-L-I-V-G-R-L. Belwick has no liquor license, let alone a red light district. Julie Bosco takes aim, then turns back to flag the pets. Look. She is pointing to a bakery window full of cakes, variously bulbous and projectile in many shades of pink and brown. One says, nothing like a piece of ass on one butt cheek, and happy birthday, Roberto, on another. There is a devil's food female torso with frosting bra and panties. There is a taste of things to come and curly Q script and a male organ sheet cake iced in marzipan. There is a have a balls of a time, Herbert, with illustrative chocolate sprinkles. Jean, how much to go inside, says Peter. He points out a cupcake. Five bucks to eat it. Ten to, oh sorry, five bucks to buy it. Ten to eat it. Even the other pets have the notion that Jean is innocent to key facts. She got out of Mrs. Leary's health ed by writing a 30-page paper about the human retina. She never even saw the woman's instructional banana. Jean would like to tell them all how much she refrains from revealing. But in fact, she refrains from revealing very little. She has not had the talk with her mother because they do not have talks. Jean's mother, in Jean's opinion, has left the building. Take the bagged lunch, deviled ham, four days straight. This is patently remiss. Take Harvey. With Jane working overtime, no one walks him. The bridges are roommates. Conversation beyond the instrumental ceased. At night, everyone eats separately at a self-appointed hour on fold-out TV trays. The disbanding confuses Harvey, who attends each private meal in turn. Each diner feeds him scraps, and he fattens. Jean declares herself vegetarian, repudiates the ham, carries to school a single obnoxious demonstrative grapefruit. The Garden. It's the last part I'll read. At the corner of Charles and Boylston, the kids enter the public garden and gather by the lagoon where the swan boats dock. In an hour, they'll regroup here and head for the museum. 
Mr. Mulford suggests before parting that they consider the different fates of light. What becomes of it in water as opposed to dirt? Absorption, reflection, diffusion. How the color of a thing is not the light it holds, but the light it rejects. How the eye understands not absolute waveforms, but relative values. How turquoise next to blue is green, but next to green is blue. How to the eye pure, eye, pure white means nothing, does not exist. And don't leave the garden and don't get abducted. Abductees flunk. One hour sharp, back here by the gate. Smurf would like to make photographic puns, ladies holding gourds at chest level. Where are these ladies? Is it too cold for a farmer's market? Art is not ugly selective, but she's here at the dispensation of Mr. Mulford, who likes her. She might zoom tight in on a flower, although it is inarguable what Lusick says that nature on close inspection is boring. Lusick loves Mr. Mulford, but finds the medium tired. The art of the art of the photograph, dialectical nostril hair. I have a fun idea, Sontag. Shut the fuck up and take off that ridiculous wig. Jean is counting on the higher wisdom of Lusick for help with ions and with this. Jean has a hand, but Lusick has an eye. A bearded vendor cries, what I have here will change your life. He hoists a squirt bottle. Smurf buys his pretzel. It is the size of her head, and she holds it to her face like a mask while Ugly takes the shot. Lusick takes the pretzel from Smurf, accepts a squirt from the man. She chews, then says a word to him in her own language. He nods. What did you say, Julie Bosco asks from nowhere, through a mouth full of fried dough. Lusick walks away from the group, looking for a bench. She wants to finish her letter. Lusick? Lusick does not turn. I told him his mustard has made me an honest woman. That's funny, says Lu Julie. Julie, says Lusick. Sorry, says Julie. Lusick stops short, and Julie bumps into her back. Sorry. Lusick turns to face her. You apologize too much, she says. You apologize, you apologize, and then everyone has to forgive you. Don't you realize how selfish that is? Ducks spill around them, closing them off from the pets. No, says Julie. I don't. She stands blinking in the weak sun, her camera tucked there. You know what we should do, says Lusick. That's the stop. OK, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. That was wonderful. It was wonderful to hear that story. Thank you very much for coming out tonight or today. Um, uh, I've never been on this beautiful campus, but I've just had a tour, and uh, it's, it's wonderful. Prettiest place I've been in a long time. I'm going to read a short story called Burst Pods Gone By Tangled Aster. Young as they appear to be, the house painters have daughters old enough to complain about, which they do to each other across an expanse of a few feet on ladders at the south-facing second-story windows of the house. From the start, Peg has stayed in the house and watched from different windows as the boys have painted. She just hopes Pat Farkey keeps sending these boys she can barely say hello to the house painters, so abashed is she by their hearty sweetness and the lives she imagines for them. Peg talks to the kitchen chairs. She's doped, of course, but the furniture is company. The young house painters lean against their truck and smoke. Smoking, she did that once. Her husband, Anders, watches the boys smoke, says something, makes them smile, or are they grimacing a little? Has he cornered them or asked something off color, personal? You getting any? That sort of thing. She's heard his coarse approximations of street talk, young talk. She's heard him asking girls, now who's your boyfriend? then lapping up their shy response. 
Anders did the Rite Aid business today, and no surprise, got to talking with the pharmacist Stephanie. He likes Stephanie. Girls open as a penny, he says. True, but Peg can hardly face her. Stephanie was the one to fill their daughter's last, newest, failed prescription, the inflating and idiot-making pills that turned the girl into a parade balloon in need of handlers, chiefly her mother. The ones that made her quiet, helped her sleep, helped her wake once a day, twice a day, twice a day with meals. Who doses her at Medfield? Peg doesn't know. They're not allowed to see her. The doctors think it best. There's nothing much to talk about over lunch, but Pat Farkey's painters, and yes, as far as Anders is concerned, they are the best on the peninsula. Yes, he is happy with the job so far. Anders catches the door before it slams, and it seems he might say more, but what she halfway hears is Anders calling Ridge or Raj, Reg, what is it? She looks out the window over the sink and sees that Ridge is the one in a pirate scarf in a squat painting the railing. Okay, and hearing Anders, the boys, brings up on ropey haunches, nods in greeting. She turns a knife in her hands and looks hard at this ridge and then through the boy to the woods again and their neighbor's field of brown stalks and burst pods gone by tangled aster. She thumbs the blade, then uses the knife to skin the watery scum off the blackened breadboard, scrapes strings and stems into the compost bag and potato peels from dinner's burger pie. My God, they do go on eating and eating. Maybe she's pushing for earlier meals to make the days pass faster. Your disappointments are mine. She had said this to Andy, to her daughter. Andy, in her boneless body, short neck, soft chin, smally featured moon face. What was a mother to make of such a face, really? Say, it's much like mine. Peg knew the horrors of undressing the crimped grooves of waistbands and camel-toed panties. A boy in school told Andy she looked like a muffin top, which Andy took at first to mean a good thing until her brother Carl told her, it's your gut hanging over your jeans. What was the matter with him? Hurts, prickly, hive-like bites, little poisons Peg can't scratch out. Maybe it's the moles on your face that make you look old, Mom. And the boy had said worse. But she didn't always remember. They call Andy a gunt, he'd said. She doesn't want to remember Gunt, but the hamburger graze in the pan and the memory of gut, cunt, gunt, and Carl's mouth, new beard, raw skin, is upended to Carl himself, loudly arrived. Hi, Mom. And behind him, his girlfriend, Leanne, both smiling as if they like her, as if they come by every day and are expected. Dad invited us. He didn't tell me. Anders points out the brushwork on the porch, rails skinny spindles. Come out and look. The name Farky is on his lips, though it's that kid, Ridge, the house painter who's done the work Anders praises. Peg watches Carl and Anders and Leanne as they look up at the spindles and the scrolled eaves on the house, this old farmhouse, once a hundred years ago, a tea house for the quarry down the road. A plaque near the front door reads, Fern Cottage, 1888. The name is Anders' invention, a dainty tea-like name and a nod to the ostrich ferns that thrive in the dark borders of the lower garden. 
What Anders is saying to these unexpected guests, mm, now Peggy has to double up on potatoes and cut limp carrots for a side dish to a stretched thin dinner of gray burger pie. The business makes her angry even as she puts out unsalted saltines and low fat cheese. And when Leanne reaches out her loose, inky arms, Peg sees smeary numbers and a wreath tattoo. She doesn't know, want to know what the tattoo stands for, doesn't want to know much at all, it seems. Now, for instance, Carl is talking about auto body parts, online, alternators, or motor mounts, belts, something he can get cheap. I want a Jaguar. Leanne says, huh. Carl, who has been listening for anything Leanne might say, takes up with Anders again about a Corvette he could fix if only if dad lends you money. No, mom. Fixing cars, she says, costs money. I'm talking about Hardy's car. I said, fixing cars. You deaf? I'm talking about Hardy's car. What he needs is to fix it. I could fix it. I could make some money fixing it, Peg. Don't call me Peg. Well, whoever you are, everything doesn't have to do with money. I'm not saying. That's all you've said. All you ever say is how much, how much, how much the painting's costing and how Farky's never here, but lets his kids do the work. Kids younger than me. I should be doing the painting, right? Nothing to fight about now, Anders says. She says, I like the house painters. They have children. They're married. Yeah, real grown up, I bet, and living happily ever. Blah, blah. You want to pick a fight, Carl? Peg, please. This is why I hate coming here. Carl pushes away from the table and Peg makes for the boy, grabs at his shirt. Don't you think you're a little old for a teenager, Carl? Leanne. The teenager looks to what Carl does and follows him out, saying nothing as Carl talks loudly about Peg the bitch. Is it any wonder Dad wants company? Carl turned 37 last March, very quietly at the kitchen table over double trouble chocolate cupcakes Peg has made for him for almost as many years. The girlfriend was missing, but Carl had seemed happy. To Peg then, maybe not to her husband, Anders, no, maybe not as happy as the house painters, but celebrating in a house with a ghost for company, what could they expect? Not much. He has an apartment. Anders helps with the rent because Carl's only part-time at the dry cleaner. He's otherwise, or says he is otherwise, taking mechanic courses at Ramapo. His nights, his days, his progress in the tech course, she doesn't ask. Carl doesn't report. Peg makes the double trouble cupcakes for herself as much as for him. A bowl liquor, a spatula sucker, she doesn't stint on sugar and it shows even though the boy ate most of them. She doesn't beat and hasn't beaten the eat healthy drum very loudly, doesn't mention weight. Sleeveless dresses still chafe her arms and underpants yank up her crack and hurt so that she stands still or moves hardly at all. One year, the boy wanted cherry pie a la mode and Peg made both the pie and the double trouble cupcakes. Today, she is barefoot in what Anders calls her farmer pants, bib overalls, and she they are softly comfortable, but loose as an old slip cover. And she is saddened to think she looks like a sofa, except that now she has no daughter to complain about. Once, but no more. Every time Peg looks at her right hand, she sees another kinked or swollen part visit her. Thank you. The custom is usually to ask anyone, right, if they have questions. Oh, do you have any questions? 
Probably not. Probably not, not now. I can ask you a question. How's that? Okay. okay. All right. Okay. So my question for you. I'll start this going. Um, I like to know as a writer how this book started and how it how it kind of changed or evolved as you worked your way into it. Like how did how did it first come to you? What was the starting point? And what changes did you kind of <clears throat> encounter mm -hmm. moving through it? Um, well, there wasn't a starting point. Very often, I think you'll encounter other writers will say that while they're writing a novel, they get lost and they don't know where they are and they don't know what they're doing, which is very common. And um, and so you turn to a story. You just turn to write something else. So, so there was a lot of that. A lot of these stories are stories I was writing when I would get st stuck on Prosperous Friends. And... Uh, only the um, the title story, Pure Hollywood. I, I, I was my aspiration was to write a novella, a perfect novella. I think I have some ideas about what a perfect novella is. Um, in any, I, my, I'm not put. Mine is not. M mine is just probably a long story that the publishers have decided to sort of say as a novella to make it seem somehow more attractive. But um, uh, it was that caused me a lot of grief. That was very difficult. I really wanted more, and um, uh, I, I didn't get more. Yeah. <laughs> what about well, you? I have. I have. I had a sort of similar grief, which is that when you, uh, if any of you end up going to an MFA program at some point, they'll bring out fancy people, and those will be agents and editors, and those people will just scare you straight by telling you that you'll never publish a collection of stories <laughs> that will do anything but lose money for the publisher. Hence, you must have a novel to sell with it, like a companion novel. And that just strikes terror into all the short story people. Layla's nodding. Yeah, yeah. And so everybody was kind of looking at the stories they had and trying to kind of mush them, force them, and meld them into a novel. And I think I thought I had maybe done that here. And certainly when I gave it to the editor who looked at it, I said, you know, real sassy as you please, here's your novel. And mm -hmm. you know, he read it and said, not so fast. You know, this is a story collection um, that are linked stories. And I think we argued a little bit, and I'll tell you that if you, if you are a first time book publisher, prepare to lose arguments with your press mm -hmm. and propose, Lose them gracefully, you know? So I tried to lose that argument gracefully, but my argument that it was a novel was predicated on the fact that there's an overarching storyline and that you can only read it in one direction. So it's cumulative. And that I had put numbers in front of the stories. <laughs> so that <laughs> apparently those aren't great, good enough arguments. So if you're in the same place <laughs> with your publisher, come up with a better argument than that. But um, yeah, I... I so part of it was sort of the terror of feeling that I needed it to be a novel. In the end, I don't know if it matters particularly. It's kind of a marketing debate in any, you know, whatever they stamp on that, whatever genre it is, right? Um, it's true. But, well, I'm going to ask you another question that I'm curious about. What is, what was the most fun story, character, or scene to write, and what was the least fun, most and least fun? The most and least fun. These are probably bad questions, but I'm just trying to get the ball going. You guys come right. in, step in at any right. moment with right. a better right. question. <laughs> oh, um, you could choose either or if you don't have to answer both. The most, well, it was a, yeah, it was the most satisfying story. It, it's a story called um, the, Duchess, the Duchess of Albany. And I was on a first time a sabbatical and had elected to, we have an old house in Maine and um, I was staying there in the fall. And my, my husband is a wonderful gardener, a master gardener. It's really quite, it's just spectacular. And, um, it, and I, 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 I'm the deadheader. I, I follow around and take orders. I, uh, it, but it's been thrilling to watch this garden over the last 20 years take, take shape. And, and, but, uh, one day, he, I was asking about this guy. I was saying, this is, I don't know who, who, who's 
who's going to keep this garden up and what happens to gardens that have been so loved and because um, this has trellises and paths and it, it's really quite gorgeous and um, and he said the garden dies with the gardener and I thought that would be a first line and that he I, I was away from him and I love him very much and um, I thought I would pretend because it would also upset me and then I could <laughs> maybe plug that into the story um, that that he was no more and that I was you know this character who was obliged to keep the garden alive and I just sort of put it to myself what would I do to keep this garden alive and how would I behave and I, I'm sorry to say that the woman in the character does not behave well uh, necessarily I, I'd like to be graceful in that process if ever the, uh, and I don't want to go there anyway the nice thing was I was able to think about my husband a lot and how lovely he is and how he is in the garden and 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 um and it made me very happy it just made me very very happy and sad too but but happy so it's one of those where you really know what you're doing and there's a lot at stake in some ways you know you want to get this one right so that was my best what about you oh okay um what was the most fun um I'm not sure if this is this is true because I feel like there's a kind of revisionist memory of the writing process. Like it's a little bit traumatizing, frankly, when you're writing it. And later when people ask you, you come up with this kind of nice sounding narrative about how you wrote it. I think it's mostly false. But I'm gonna say to you that I think the most fun was the first story here to write because it was the last one I wrote and it was when I already had an interested editor. I have to say it's a lot more fun writing <laughs> when someone <laughs> wants your book and you have a pending book contract mm. and it doesn't feel like you're pitching stories into a dark hole. So I think that made it fun. Um, but it also was fun because I had everything else there and what I had done was these stories act as kind of a Sorry to the students who are sitting here, and I'm going to say things that I already said to you yesterday. And you're going to be like, ah, all right. So these stories kind of function as a failed Q&A between a mother and a daughter, where each story is preceded by a question that the daughter's posing to her mother. And the answer is actually the daughter's own answer. She's kind of fictionalizing her mother's history. So um, I, had, I had all these stories that were doing that. And then I had tacked on this really pedantic little um, epilogue that explained to the reader how the stories worked. And the editor looked at that epilogue and said, yeah, that's not staying here. That's really obnoxious and expository. So that's got to go write another story. And so that's the task he gave me. And I felt like we were in this ultimatum, like write me, write me another story that does the work of that epilogue, but in narrative. And if so, you'll have a book contract with me. So, you know, that puts a little fire under you. So I feel like I was writing in a way that um, my husband Nasser, who's sitting here, saw me for the first time, like in this red chair that we have, just kind of like installed there for maybe, I don't know, eight hours, and like my hands moving frantically, and then somehow the story came out. I think it was also kind of fun, because I was writing about a job um, in animation that I had about for a decade that I was really glad not to be doing anymore. And so that's a little liberating. Um, and I might have been writing about it slightly meanly. Someone asked me the other day in class, when are you being mean and when are you being honest? And I think, I, I think in this story, in retrospect, I'm being a little mean. <laughs> so, and it's sometimes fun to be a little bit mean. So I think that was fun. Um, Okay, enough, enough of the banter. Who has a question here for us? Anybody? Anything. Yeah, Layla, no, I have one, which is uh, something I'm always curious about. What do you all read when you're writing? Or do you read? Because I don't necessarily well, read I can, I, I can answer that I, I purposely do not read anything that kind of is adjacent to what I'm doing. Um, I think I get uh, um, uncomfortable that I'll stumble on a better version of me, you know, and it will kind of make obsolete the work I'm doing. But I kind of like to read stuff that um, is, is all the stuff I'm incapable of. So like people who are really verbose, 
people who are expansive, um, like stuff they assign you in, you know, 11th grade of high school that I never read, like, you know, the mayor of Castor Bridge, like that kind of stuff. I sort of go back to this stuff that is absolutely not what I'm going to write, but it kind of liberates me a little bit. I think it's also, like, it gives me, um, uh, like access to language and stuff that has different rhythms for me. Sometimes the more, it's a more a question of what I watch or listen to that is more directly in line or it has an affinity with what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, we watch a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race. I don't know what the kinship is with my writing, but <laughs> it's incredibly gratifying. How about you? Um, well, we, we were asked this the other night or some version of it. Um, uh, and I, I recently I take up Elizabeth Hardwick, Sleepless Nights. She's got a lot of language, and um, and poets. Um, uh, Sh Seamus Heaney uh, last summer was utterly great. I, I I just he has so much sound, and um, uh and then I try to stay up. I'll read newer books and just see what, what what's afoot and what people are doing. Um, but but um, no, I look I look for people with a lot of language. Robert Lowell. I, I have to say the poets are the easiest ones to go to. The minute you see them and the minute you read them and you know they they're they're way up there and that's quite thrilling and you, they are they are on the higher slopes of parnassus and you you sort of think well, i i'd like to i would like to reach those too so i find them the most uh, that's really great to me i think if they can do that because i don't think there really should be any distinction between prose and 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 poetry so that's helpful okay thank you so much for coming and taking your lunch with us very nice.